Uh, I'm Richard Anantua, and I braved the long flight from UC Berkeley <laughs> to present work I've been doing with my collaborators, Roger, uh, Sasha Chakoskoy at Northwestern, Elia Porter at Berkeley, and his grad student, Sean Ressler, on emission modeling near-horizon regions in active galactic nuclei using the methodology of observing jet or outflow, accretion flow, black hole or jab systems, as I've decided to coin. <laughs> and the methodology starts with a general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulation of uh, GRMHD flow variables, such as the rest mass density, rho, the total gas energy density, ug, and this pointer doesn't work, or does it? No, it did. Oh, okay. It pointed at the computer. Okay, point. Yeah. Oh. oh, you mean does it, it doesn't Point work as a pointer? Okay, so I am going to get oh. my own pointer. Sorry. That might not work either on those screens, actually. Let's discuss the physics of laser pointers. Ah, this one works. Yes, okay. Barely. That's fine. If oh, that's nice. The oh. magnetic four vector, B mu, uh, the magnetic, uh, sorry, the, the fluid four velocity, U mu, and we convert these outputs of GRMHD simulations into quantities related to the emissions, such as the electron temperature, Te, the electron uh, gas pressure of relative electrons, Pe, and the electron gas energy density, Ue. And we do this uh, in order to model uh, sources uh, specifically images in spectra that are targets of VLBI uh, instruments such as the Event Horizon Telescope. Which is, oh, come on. <laughs> Which has baselines across the globe in order to form a large collecting area at high resolution to produce uh, some synthetic images. And we fix ideas with a couple of sources that have the largest angular width black holes from here, which are the one at the galactic center, Sagittarius A star, and the one in the giant elliptical galaxy, M87. And we also consider discrete observational signatures at other wavelengths, too, to describe this methodology. So we prescribe a few simple parametric emission models uh, such as the electron temperature model, I'm going to have to uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. give you the form of this. So we assume that Te over a uh, simulation temperature, which is roughly the proton temperature, uh, given that electrons cool a lot faster than the protons, we take this as a, some background temperature, goes like the fraction of the total heating in the simulation uh, <laughs> going into electrons times some exponential in the plasma beta over a critical value of the plasma beta where plasma beta is the gas pressure over the magnetic pressure. And this model has the behavior that the electron temperature is roughly constant at low beta segments of the plasma and it's exponentially decaying at the high beta segments of the plasma. And GRMHD simulations show that this model heats up a interface between uh, strong outflow and uh, inflow, and uh, we call this layer a corona, and uh, this electron temperature model is, is hottest in that boundary layer. We also have a constant beta model where this value of beta goes to constants like 0 0.01 or, or 0.1 or 1 uh, in order of the magnetic versus uh, particle uh, uh, energy density content of the plasma. And we generalize the beta model to have uh, PE scale like magnetic pressure to the n, and there's a normalization constant because these units can, the, the, this uh, PB has units of magnetic field squared. So we have a, a so-called bias model parameterized by this exponent n, which takes values from 0, uh, 2, and 4 in the parameter space that we scan. 
And these uh, mission uh, model prescriptions are simple and fairly stylized, and they uh, can capture the essential physics in terms of a uh, couple of parameters such as Fe or beta, uh, uh, or, or beta crit, or a constant beta, or this exponent n. And we also have some models that relate the partial pressure due to electrons emitting at the observed frequency p tilde to momentum transport alpha, which is inspired by Shakur and Tsunayev's alpha model. Or we can relate this to velocity shear, dbz, ds. Or we can relate this to current density. And using these emission models, we try to emulate observations such as that by the Event Horizon Telescope that's viewing the galactic center at 230 gigahertz. And from the visibility amplitude versus baseline, we can construct a characteristic size. So if we assume that the emitting region of the galactic center looks like some sort of uh, binary Gaussian, then we can construct a characteristic size based on this data. Uh, and this size is constrained to be 37 micro arc second uh, characteristic size of the emitting region. We can also uh, compare with observations of the spectrum, which is roughly supported from 10 to the 10 hertz microwaves to 10 to the 20 uh, hertz x-rays. And there's a submillimeter bump in the observations. So with these uh, image and spectral uh, observations, we can try to reverse engineer some of them using our parameterized emission models. And throughout the scan of these model parameters that I've written down, I've ordered the synthetic images that were uh, made by post-processing the GRMH simulations with the various emission models specified here, except, of course, any time that you see an equal sign without a beta over here, there should be a beta, mm -hmm. there should be a, the, a beta. Uh, the n's luckily come out, but uh, there should be uh, f and beta c that uh, scan the parameter space. <coughs> f goes from 0.1 to 0.5. Actually, let me do this in set theory notation. So it's a Cartesian product of, of this with the uh, beta C goes from 0 0.01, 0 0.1 to 1. So F and beta C are scan these six values. And the highest value of F and beta C is represented in this model with an asymmetric crescent emitting region that's concordant with the EHT size constraint. And the lowest value beta model is also the uh, smallest emitting region size. Uh, and the other models don't conform to the EHT size constraint, and they have more contributions from more extended segments of the outflow, which you can see here. And some of them have uh, puffy photon rings are, uh, that are lighting up the inflow uh, in an asymmetric manner as well. So these models are our favorite uh, models with respect to the size constraint. Now with respect to the spectra for Sag A star, I've overplotted uh, these uh, F beta C models, even though you don't see F and beta C because they didn't come out, uh, <laughs> for the scan of parameter space. And these spectra uh, are more peaked than the data in general, except for the highest value of f and beta c, which was also our favored uh, parameter values for the uh, image size. So with respect to morphology and spectra, we have the best fitting uh, model across this uh, nine or so decades of, of magnitude. And the more peak spectra that you see for the lower values of f or beta c, we account for in the phenomenological model where we think that this emission is coming from an expanding corona and the distribution of temperatures in this idiopathically uh, expanding corona is, is falling sharply or, and this leads to more sharply peak spectra in this model pram, uh, parameter family. The spectra in the bias and beta models have the opposite problem for the large part in that they are flatter than the observed spectra. And 
these are beta equals 0 0.01, beta equals 0.1, beta equals 1, n equals 0, and n equals 4 uh, beta and bias models. And we account for this in a phenomenological picture where the outflows are contributing most to the emission. And we uh, presume that a blanford conigal outflow can account for the flatness of the spectrum at equal partition, where the constant beta models are equal, equal partition models. And these leads to flat spectra and isothermal jets has been shown in GRMHD simulations. So that's a phenomenological picture with that. And quickly going on to uh, our next target, M87. M87 is a giant elliptical galaxy 54 million light years from us. It's jets and it's counter jet source uh, emission from radio to gamma rays. And this is a 43 gigahertz uh, intensity map of the inner about 10 milliard seconds of declination and about 25 milliard seconds of right ascension. And we can see that the general morphology are two edge brightened so-called limbs and a counter jet. And at higher frequencies, such as EHC frequencies, you'll see a core shift where you'll see this image uh, be constricted to smaller and smaller lens scales and the core will shift inwards. So our first uh, test of our models versus these observations come where we use a collimation profile of the outflow that has been uh, observed by VLA and EHT data. So this would be cylindrical radius S versus uh, length along the jet Z. And this collimation profile is compared with two of our models, the n equals zero bias model, which roughly has constant pressure along the outflow, and the beta model, which has a higher uh, relation of uh, PE with a power of B. And since in the simulation we observed that magnetic field strength is concentrated along a small core at small cylindrical radii, it makes sense for this model to, be, to have a broader collimation profile than, than this model. In another comparison with another of our stylized models with uh, the magnetic field substructure, if we had a little bit higher resolution, we'd be able to make out that this substructure looks like a number of twisted flux tubes that seems like a Twizzler. If it, it, it looks a little bit better uh, on the screen. And this type of magnetic field substructure may be due to kinking instabilities that we can analyze in our uh, simulation. And a similar thing that occurs in our bias model with n equals zero is a corkscrewing feature that you will see in this movie. So you see that there's an in inner magnetic field substructure that appears to kink outward. And this is done on a cadence of uh, 56 days per frame. And we move on to another of our emission models. This one relates the dissipation to the uh, square of the current density. So the partial pressure due to electrons emitting at the observed frequency goes like the square of the, uh, the current density. And in this prescription, we light up current sheets in our uh, synthetic images. So you'll see a core of current, uh, which is roughly the J component of Z going outward. But then you'll also see flailing current sheets inward as I play this movie. So you see that there are these current sheets that are, are return current uh, that are roughly closing a circuit here. And these can roughly be compared to these uh, limbs that are also uh, not fixed to the, uh, not, not rigidly fixed as uh, the central region here. And there could be some Doppler deprojection effects that account for why there is uh, such an absence of emission here rather than in our images. And in our other image, uh, in the synthetic image, we have another effect that uh, is represented by our emission prescriptions where if this panel came out, you would see that uh, the emission function uh, depends on the effective magnetic field to some power, let me just call it one plus alpha. And the effective magnetic field equals the Doppler factor uh, times, to the minus one, times the angle that the co-moving magnetic field makes with the observer direction. So this, this uh, observer uh, angle de dependence of the synchrotron emission here makes it so that as you go across this, the 
uh, the two sides of the jet, you have a very different uh, um, uh, uh, n hat, which is your observer direction, and you may, and sorry, you have a, a, the same n hat, but you have a uh, different angle made with the magnetic field if its structure is a uh, helix, for instance. So we have about two minutes left. All right, okay, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll leave you with my conclusions on how our synthetic uh, intensity and uh, intensity maps and spectra uh, for a Sag star are roughly coronal uh, projections for the intensity maps with some photon rings depending on the parameter values that can also expose inflow versus outflow, uh, especially for the equal partition inspired beta and bias models. And the emitting regions for the low beta and the high F and beta C are the most compact and asymmetric favoring our observations. And the spectra tend to work best with the best model for our uh, emitting region in, in the electron temperature models. And they're flatter for decreasing beta for the beta models and uh, for decreasing it in the uh, bias models. And for M87, we can reproduce certain observational discrete signatures like collimation and the magnetic field uh, substructure. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. The work I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit different from the other work in this session, so I, I hope that I can make this accessible to everyone. And most of this work has been published uh, in January of this year in a journal called Theranostics. So I want to start with the basic idea of cancer, and of course cancer is a medical problem, and one of the types of cancer that we're focusing on for this project is metastatic brain cancer. And that means you have a primary tumor somewhere in the body, that cancer cells enter the blood vessel, they circulate through your body, and at some point they're going to leave the blood, enter a different tissue, a different organ, and form a secondary site of cancer there. Now there are many different types of primary cancer that can metastasize to the brain. So if we want to treat brain metastases, we need to not be targeting biologically the primary tumor, but we need a more general technique that will be able to treat many different types of cells. So what we're looking at, and we did some initial work to look at this biologically, is that this image in the kind of brownish color, that's the blood vessel, and the blue cells are the cancerous cells. So this is in a mouse model of metastasis. But what we see is that initially, before a large tumor has formed in the brain, that those cancer cells have left the blood vessel, maybe just starting with one, and then they divide and multiply and stay right around the blood vessel. So what this means is as long as we are targeting this metastatic brain cancer early enough, those cells are localized to the site of the original um, the extravasation, leaving the blood vessel. So, our preventative treatment for brain metastasis focuses on this. And I call this preventative because in general we have to be targeting the metastases before there are any symptoms present and before there's any imaging possible to know that metastasis is forming. So this is something we would be injecting into patients that statistically are likely to develop metastases but we would not know necessarily have. So somewhere in the brain, our cancer cells are leaving the blood vessel and going into the healthy brain tissue, which is surrounding the vessel. And what our goal is, is to target something in the blood vessel itself to bind with antibodies, a therapeutic, where that therapeutic is going to have a radioactive isotope on it. That radioactive nucleus will decay, the radiation produced will then target the cells right around the blood vessel, and as I'll describe in a little bit, then will cause DNA damage. So the key here is that we're targeting the location that the cancer cells are leaving the blood vessel and we will localize the radiation there. So biologically, we're using something called VCAM1. And this work was done at Oxford University a few years ago. And what they saw, and it's a little hard to see on the screen, especially if you're not used to looking at fluorescent images. The blue here represents the blood vessel itself and the green are the cancerous cells that had left. The red is a, then a marker, the fluorescent signal, from the VCAM1. There is a greater amount of red, it's easier to see in the inset, right where those cancerous cells have left the blood vessel. Is this an image or a simulation? This is an image, yeah. yeah this is a fluorescent image. So effectively, VCAM1 is kind of a marker of inflammation. So as those cancerous cells have pushed through the endothelial <coughs> cells, the blood vessel cells, they're going to uh, increase their... Uh, the amount of VCAM1 on those cells. So they also developed an antibody that can target VCAM1 
So this is the biological signal we're using to know that that is a site where the cancer cells have actually left the blood. So that's our biological part. I'm a physicist, and the physics part is then identifying what type of radioactive nuclide we want to use that is going to target this effectively from a geometric point of view. So there are many different isotopes used within medicine, and we started by looking at a large number of them. And the beta emitters, decay through beta decay, Auger electron emitters are very low energy electron emitters, and then a lot of the alpha emitters are actually these more complex decay chains, such as lead-212 that I'm showing here. So three are in bold, actinium, lead, and lutetium, and those have some more detailed results compared to the rest of them. The key idea here is that even though lead itself first decays through beta decay, if you trace the two possible paths to the stable isotope of lead at the end, you always have two beta emissions and one alpha emission. So that alpha emission is really key and is going to really determine its therapeutic benefit, and so that's why it's classified as an alpha emitter even though the lead itself is not an alpha emitter. The reason we would use lead and not this bismuth 212 isotope itself is that this has a half-life of only about an hour. That's not enough time to actually generate your radioactive nucleide, do the radiochemistry, and actually get it into the patient. So with a half-life of about 10 and a half hours, lead is quite nice as a therapy. So understanding this complex decay chain, all of the other like gammas um, that are also emitted this is where we would use a simulation approach and some physics as necessary. Instead of just picking one of these and doing some mouse studies, our idea was to use computer simulations to first determine the best isotope to use and then to actually do some mouse studies with it. So for a physics audience, I always feel the need to talk a little bit more about cancer and how we treat it. So when we think about cancer, we normally start by thinking about people, our patients and their symptoms. But within the tumor of a patient, of course, it's made up of cells. And within the DNA, uh, within the nucleus of the cell, we have DNA. So from a fundamental medical physics point of view, when we go to treat this cancer, we can't really think about it just at the patient scale. We actually want to think about it at the DNA scale. So with, what, with our therapy, really what we want to do is cause DNA damage, and specifically something called a double strand break, where you've really broken both parts of the double helix it's very difficult for cells to repair this. So it's very likely that they're going to die through a process called apoptosis, programmed cell death, or they're just going to be able, unable to multiply further. So causing double strand break is going to lead to cell death, which will lead to tumor shrinkage. So really we are interested in a clinical application, but I'm going to keep talking about DNA damage. So our basic idea, we have kind of the biological thing we're thinking about here, but then we're doing a simulation of it. So the blood vessel is going to become this central cylinder. And we know that our radioactive therapeutic is binding to the inside of the blood vessel, so the radioactive decays in our simulation will be occurring on the surface of that cylinder. Representing the brain tissue is then just outside of that cylinder. And what we're looking at is going to be the energy deposited and then double strand breaks as a function of distance from that blood vessel since we have some model of where those cancerous cells are. So the simulation I performed is in JONT4, which is originally coming from the particle physics, high energy physics world, but is now more often used in medical physics. And there are two parts of this simulation. Um, the first part is just looking at the JONT4 data itself. So I recorded the interactions, the energy deposits in this central cylinder, and then was able to plot dose, which is just energy divided by volume, over a function of distance. Now this was done down to about a 1 keV threshold, so that's actually considered low energy, but the second model actually went down to a minimum energy of 8 eV. And this was then done in finite regions of interest that were these boxes placed in specific locations, and this used a package called JAMP4 DNA, and this has been developed to really look at DNA damage and try to go down to the minimum energy necessary to create um, really molecular breaks. So what we took uh, this data for is to run in a second algorithm that actually constructed the DNA molecule in its chromatin fiber up atom by atom, where a sphere represented every atom. We then filled this box with DNA and tracked where every interaction would then map onto that DNA molecule to look for single strand breaks, which then, if they're close enough together, form double strand breaks. So JOT4 gives us some just 
dose or energy deposition information, but then we had a second part that actually gave us double strand breaks. So the initial results were just coming from JOT4 alone, and this is looking at dose as a function of distance from that rate, um, from the blood vessel. So one thing to notice is that the alpha emitters on the left, the y-axis scale is different than the electron emitters. So you have a lot more dose, and this is per decay of that parent isotope, for your alpha emitters versus your electron emitters. But the most important feature here is the difference in shape. That each class of emitters here have similar shapes, but the key is that for the alpha emitters, you have a gradual decrease and then a steep fall off of a few orders of magnitude. What that means is we can have our cancerous cells ideally falling within that high dose region, and then the healthy cells are largely spared. There's not as much of a differentiation for the electron emitters. So this alone really favors the alpha emitters, and the two that we looked at in more detail is our actinium-225, the black line, which has the highest dose, and then lead-212, which is the yellow line, which had the deepest penetration. So the second thing that we wanted to look at was really double strand break yield. So not just the physical dose, but how is this actually going to cause DNA damage? And in this case, we're comparing the alpha emitter to uh, lead 212 to an electron emitter, lutetium 177. You see that the alpha emitter gives you a lot more DNA damage. Now this is again per initial decay, which you can think of that being basically per molecule of therapeutic deposited at the targeted site. And in the case of the alpha emitter, you don't only have more dose deposited, but there's actually more DNA damage per dose. And the reason for this is that as the alpha particle travels through material, the energy deposits are clustered in a way that are more likely to give you DNA damage in the form of double strand breaks, where for an electron emitter, you'll have some DNA damage, but it's more spread out. So you're less likely to get a double strand break. So from this, we could say, okay, the alpha emitters are clearly superior. Let's move on with that. But there's a problem. I already showed you the decay chain of lead 212. This is the decay chain for actinium 225. And again, it's even more complex than the lead one was. And this introduces uh, a challenge into our work. So we can imagine that we've designed a beautiful therapeutic with actinium 225, so the antibody has bound it to the vasculature, the, the blood vessel, at the site of our metastasis. And sometime later, actinium has a 10-day half-life, it's going to decay. Now, when it decays, it produces an alpha particle, which is going to irradiate our cancer cells as we want, but that daughter nucleus, the francium, might be liberated. It might no longer be bound by, um, to the blood vessel, and it's now in the blood vessel itself. So we can think about starting a clock at this point and asking what happens as a function of time from that first decay of the actinium. At some later time, the francium is further down the decay chain and decays there, producing an alpha particle somewhere else, no longer at our original site. Now, the second problem with that is that it means that that alpha particle here is not being of therapeutic benefit. So if we think as a function of time, what is happening if our daughter nuclei are not retained here, how effective is our therapy then? So we did this study for lead-212 and actinium-225 and for lead, which are the circles, we've gone from the red filled circles to the purple open circles, it, we've gone from looking like an alpha emitter to looking like an electron emitter. And the reason was that first stage is just an electron emission. We used the cutoff of about one second, which was kind of just a hand wavy estimate of how long it might take for all of the daughter nucleides to be flushed from the targeted site. For actinium-225, going from the triangles filled to open, there's a slight decrease in double strand um, breaks. However, the penetration is significantly decreased. So for actinium-225, we lose a little bit of the local therapeutic benefit, but now we might not actually be treating deep enough into the brain tissue to make sure that we've irradiated all of the cancerous cells. So there is, of course, further work ongoing. Uh, the big thing is mouse work to actually now test this therapy. And this is being done with the lead-212 as our, our first study. Now, I can't show you results from that. Biologists really don't like showing unpublished results. <laughs> However, um, this has been submitted for publication. And I want to assure you, though my work has been physics, we've been doing mouse studies the entire time to use the biology to influence our geometry. 
The second thing that we're trying to understand is the chemistry necessary to retain the daughter isotopes to make sure that the therapy is maximally effective. And one way is just a choice in chemistry of how we, we actually attach that radioactive isotope to the antibody. And there are two kind of common chelators, and it's thought that one of them is going to be more stable than the other. So we're investigating this through simulation and through experimental work. So I am part of a large collaboration working on this. Oxford University is really the lead on this project. My collaborators at University of Campinas in Brazil have done the, the DNA damage algorithm. And then my collaborators in France are the ones who are doing the mouse work and a lot of the biological data. So I'm the JAMP4 person and the American. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to, of course, recognize the many sources of funding necessary to do this project and my wonderful uh, DARE cohort, D4, and of course, uh, Stanford for all of the support. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I feel very lucky, especially to be part of such an uh, excellent group here today. Um, right, so in the next 15 minutes, I want to try to convince you that quantum gravity has a, a music to it, uh, that you can actually hear it uh, in a sense. Uh, this is a work, um, this is a, based on a work that is not top secret, but yet to come out <laughs> uh, in a, a bit, quite soon, hopefully next week. Uh, with uh, Cindy, Ke excuse me, Cindy Keeler at uh, Arizona State University, and also uh, also at ASU, uh, talented graduate student Andrew Svesko, who is applying this year. So, if you happen across his application, you might do all the scooping up. Um, right. So um, the results of this work uh, are a bit technical, but we're going to ease into it. Okay. And uh, the way that we're going to ease into it is I wanted to try to invite you to ask a question with me, a very deeply related question that is a, a classical question, or classic question in physics, and classical also, uh, which is, uh, can one hear the shape of a drum? So this is the title of a paper um, by Kack in 1966. And um, we, well, here's what we have known for hundreds of years. What we've, or at least over 100. <laughs> what we've known is um, that given the shape of a drum, uh, I can tell you what its, um, nor its eigenfrequencies are going to be, so-called normal mode frequencies. And the way that works is I know that if I hit a drum, the vertical displace displacement of that membrane is going to satisfy a wave equation where C contains information about the, the shape of the drum. And this wave equation, it admits so-called uh, separable solutions of this form. And when you can separate them out like this, the omega uh, are called normal modes. And if you just plug in uh, the separable solution into the wave equation, uh, you find uh, you get a sort of a, what, and plus the boundary conditions, you get uh, quantized solutions, and you see that very nearly these uh, omegas turn out to be very closely related to the eigenvalues of this kinetic operator. And so the two, uh, the two concepts that we're going to be taking with us throughout this entire talk are normal modes and eigenvalues of kinetic operators and the fact that those things are related. But the question that CAC asks is, well, okay, can we go the other way? What if I give you the uh, normal modes of some drum, uh, can I guess its shape? Uh, does anybody in the room actually happen to know the answer to this question? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> You're like, no. Uh, <laughs> Well, um, so the answer it turns out to be uh, sometimes. Uh, so um, yeah, at some, some quarter century later, uh, in the 1990s, objectively the best decade, uh, Carolyn Gordon and uh, collaborators, they found that in systems, if a drum is like, quite symmetric, like a, a circular drum head, and you give me the frequencies, yeah, I can tell you that that's a circle quite symmetric. 
But they did come up with this counterexample of these two extremely funky looking drums uh, that have the same area, same perimeter, uh, but they uh, produce uh, I different, uh, different normal notes, uh, which you somehow should be able to glean from this picture. <laughs> but <laughs> I know, yeah, but the, the, the take home message is that they have a, a different set. So sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. But this kind of, so in my research, we're kind of, this begs the question, well, what if there are, what other things can one hear? What, my, what my, blah, should one be able to hear? And so you might ask, uh, well, can you hear a black hole merger? That's a little bit of a jump, uh, but I, had to, I couldn't resist uh, putting that up here. Uh, this is, so we heard uh, the whole physics community, I think, was quite excited. Uh, when LIGO answered this question, yes, uh, they detected uh, uh, gravitational waves uh, from a black hole merger. Uh, and this sort of uh, ring down uh, region here, uh, these are called quasi-normal modes. Not normal modes, but quasi-normal modes. And the quasi is a, it refers to the, the damping here. And so how does that work? That works. Um, if omega, say, uh, has an imaginary component, right? And so if we were to go back, oh yeah, this is the equation from the previous slide. If we were to put in an imaginary mega and work in units where c is equal to one, it's fun, or very fun to do this, you can just, uh, so ignore c, uh, then uh, we see that uh, these quasi-normal modes are exactly the eigenvalues of this, uh, of this kinetic. Um, and so it turns out that eigenvalues of kinetic operators, or spectra of kinetic operators, are very, very useful tools in mathematics, physics, so they, which we're, we're going to find out a little bit about in a second. Uh, but more generally, uh, even more generally than, uh, than the LIGO uh, situation, say you have just a, a black hole, theoretical object, a solution to Einstein's equations, and say you have maybe other particle content out here that we call a field in quantum field theory, some field, and uh, say you shake it. Because of the black hole, uh, you won't have standing wave solutions because once that perturbation goes in, it can never come out again. And so uh, you get what's called a quasi-neural mode. This is a very general thing that can happen. Uh, theoretical setups. I should mention actually that one thing that I was kind of confused about for a long time is the hearing uh, aspect of this. I should point out that these waves we're talking about are transverse waves. Uh, they're not sound waves, uh, but it just ha so happens uh, in the LIGO thing that the frequencies were like in the audible range. It's like a you know, spooky sort of thing. <laughs> um, Okay, great. So now, so now we can hear sometimes the shape of the drum. We can hear a black hole merger. Let's keep going. Like, what else can we hear? Now, the next slide is even more of a jump. I'm going to brace you for it. Uh, now, the next thing we're going to ask is, uh, can we hear quantum gravity? And in order to do that, I need to tell you what I what I mean uh, by quantum gravity. But we'll be able we'll be able to do it. I realized a little bit too late that the uh, content of this slide uh, might not be uh, familiar to everyone. However, um, I think that we can do it. I think that we can. So, so this, is a, this is a partition function. Um, it's a really like fundamental quantity in physics. So you're, you're familiar with like the um, thermodynamics partition function. So that uh, is e to the minus beta h. Okay, and this is a sum over different states. So if I had a two spin state, you know I'd sum over up, up, down, up, up, down, down, down. Okay, so this is a similar thing. Instead of a sum over states, however, um, in the path integral formulation, we sum over different field configurations. And in quantum gravity, we also sum over, we don't assume a fixed background uh, space-time, so we also sum over different uh, metrics. 
so that's what quantum gravity is. And so this is object is called uh, the full uh, Euclidean partition function. Euclidean, uh, let's just say, it's for calculational ease. Okay. So this object is, uh, let's say, hard to calculate. Uh, it might not be possible to calculate it, in fact, for some, in some cases. Um, so what we often do, as in, uh, as in other areas of physics, we, we take uh, what's called the semi-classical uh, or saddle point approximation. So we expand this out. Uh, this kappa has units one over h bar. Uh, and we're interested in the sort of a first order quantum contribution, uh, which is given by this guy here. So star just means that it's a, a solution to uh, solution to Einstein's equations, solution to the uh, Klein-Gordon equation, or the um, yeah the equation of motion for that scalar field. And so what we find is if um, so you, if you do this, um, if you actually, this is, a, this is an example for when this is a uh, scalar field. Uh, if, you, if you actually were to do this, uh, compute this functional integral, uh, which we learned how to do, you find that it's, um, lo and behold, it, uh, it has to do with the spectrum of a kinetic operator, right? So this determin determinant of the Laplacian is coming up again, and uh, so, like these uh, spectra of kinetic operators is, is, our, is our window into the first order effects of quantum gravity. And so uh, physicists are very interested in calculating these things. Mathematicians happily are interested for calculating these things uh, for different reasons, but which we exploit. <laughs> so and, and this, this line is just to say, just to remind us that, of course, uh, the determinant of, of an operator is just the product of its eigenvalue. And this is an infinite product for the Laplacian, right? It is an infinite product. That's a, gr that's a great question. So you need to uh, regularize mm -hmm. it. I won't be talking about that. But if you, if, you ask a, if you ask at the end, there's actually a really cool thing. Uh, this is a generic loop diagram. Don't look at it. <laughs> I don't know why I put that there. It uh, doesn't mean anything. Um, so picture it in about three minutes left. OK, thanks. Uh, right, so, so now, uh, oh, this is a little fuzzy. So now it turns out that, um, so there's a, uh, there's a theorem in uh, complex analysis called Weierstrass factorization theorem. And just as long as this partition function is well behaved, it can be written as a, a product of its poles and zeros. So this thing doesn't have any zeros, because there's a one up here, it just has poles. And it turns out that you can, in fact, so you can write this partition function as a product of its poles. And uh, it has uh, poles when this quantity is equal to zero. And it turns out that, so you can write this partition function in terms of the quasi-neural modes uh, and so-called uh, Matsubara frequencies, which uh, we can just take as uh, frequencies in uh, thermodynamics that come up. So th this is what they are for a static black hole. You can write them down for other things. This is what's called the conformal dimension. Uh, you can just take this to be uh, the correct math parameter, uh, the correct uh, mass parameter to use. And so again, the answer is yes, because you can see here that if you know all the quasi-normal modes of that space-time that fall into the black hole, like I drew on another slide, it builds up the partition function. And so this one loop partition function is built from these quasi normal modes. So that's exciting. And so last slide with content that I have is um, one now can get kind of, can keep going with this and say, well, can one hear this, this sh the shape of space time? Uh, and it turns out that you can, of course. Um, well, not of course. I mean, that's my entire project. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So it turns out that if you work in certain space times uh, called hyperbolic quotients, so this is hyperbolic space. It's just a maximally, maximally symmetric space time with negative cosmological constant. These uh, uh, are supposed to be the geodesics, these great semicircles. There aren't actually fish in there. This is just a diagram. <laughs> and uh, so this is what hyperbolic space time is. What a hyperbolic quotient is, is if you identify 
uh, some of these geodesics and like fold it over. That's called a, a quotient uh, space time. If you have such a space time, it turns out that you can um, build an object called a Selberg zeta function um, used in mathematics that is determined completely by that space time, irrespective of field content. Uh, and what we are showing is that this guy, it has this, this object has zeros whenever the, the argument of the exponential is equal to 2 pi i times an integer. And uh, just to state the result, what we find is when the conformal dimension of, of the field in question that I defined on the previous slide is equal to the zeros of this particular zeta function, that is equivalent to requiring uh, that the so-called Matsubar frequencies are equal to the quasi-normal mode frequencies. So again, this, what this amounts to is these quasi-normal mode frequencies are also involved with building up this Selberg zeta function, which is only um, a function of the space-time in question. So, turns out that given the quasi-normal modes of a, of a space-time, you can also build up this object that tells you what the space-time is in particular examples that I've looked at. Uh, so the answer is again, yes. So um, I, there are other results uh, that I could talk about really quick, but uh, I'll go ahead and leave that for the question and answer session and just say uh, <laughs> <perfect> there. <laughs>